Good evening, everybody. Um, the man who needs no introduction. Thank you. Um, it's great to see so many people here, and we're here really to discuss and celebrate the release of Vince's first uh, solo album called Sounds of Silence. And um, it's kind of appropriate that we're doing this in, at the Rough Trade Shop, because the first time we didn't really meet, but the first time we saw each other um, was at the original Rough Trade Shop at 202 Kensington Park Road. Um, it was a bit of a non-meeting, really, but it was back in 1980. Maybe, Vince, can you remember? Yes, yeah, so what it was was um, uh, Dave Garn and I, um, we had, we'd made a demo, well, the, the band had made a demo, and Dave and I took it to various record companies, and that was back in the day when you could actually go into the, literally go into the office and say, can you play my cassette? And we went to, um, to Rough Trade, because Rough Trade were really cool. And still played, are, right? And still are, of course, yeah. <laughs> and um, played our cassette, and they said, you know, it, they said, it's, it's not really our cup of tea, and they, <laughs> and, so, and they asked, and Daniel happened to be in the, in the office. Yeah, and I was in a bad mood, because um, <laughs> uh, I was just about, we were just trying to get the first Fad Gadget album out, Fireside Favourites, and there was a problem with the artwork that had gone wrong, and I was just in a really bad mood. And um, a great guy, Scott Peering, late Scott Peering, who was uh, talking to the guys, uh, said, oh, you know, Daniel might like this. Um, hey, why don't you come over and have a listen? And I said, no, 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 I'm just too busy. I'm a, I've got to go, sorry, bye. And then, <laughs> so, uh, and then, um, it was a few weeks later, I saw, I saw them play live at the Bridge House. Yeah, we, so, yeah, we were supporting um, Fag Gadget. And that was, yeah, we might talk about the past, but let's talk about the new album first. Yes. Your first ever solo album, why? Well, it wasn't really, a, it, 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 it was never intended as an album. You know, I, I was, during COVID, um, you know, I was just looking for things to do. And I started off by doing a couple of internet um, online history courses and that went on for a while. And then I started working on some tracks or some demo tracks for the, for the next, hopefully the next um, Erasure record. That finished, and then I thought, you know, I had this Euro rack system, and it was quite a small system, and I'd never really um, used it or learned how to use it, so I decided that I would experiment with it. And I was watching Blade Runner 2, <laughs> and you know, I don't know if you're. A, I'm a science fiction fan, but I'm a huge fan of Blade Runner one. And I, you know, you go and watch this film, and you think there's there's no way that they can make this better. And I watched it four times, <laughs> and on the fourth time, I realised actually it was probably better. But the music really inspired me. The the the, 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 um, the soundtrack to the film, and I thought to myself, I'm going to go and make Blade Runner three. <laughs> So I went downstairs into my studio and started making these drones. And that was the, the, the birth of the project, really. But it was never intended as a record. It was really just for me to learn how to use the synthesizer. It was like an exercise, almost. So I spent many, many hours watching YouTube tutorials on um, Euro rack modules, you know, and if you into that stuff, you know, it's, it's really, really interesting, <laughs> I think. So that, that, was, that was the start of the whole thing. It's interesting that, um, because, you know, so, as some of you all might know, Vince has an incredible collection of uh, vintage synthesizers, amazing collection, and um, which all sound great, but you, you, you decided to use the Eurorack instead. Yeah. It was very specific, only because I didn't know how... To, I, I, I hate the idea of having gear... Um, that's not used. You know, I, I, there was one time in my, in, in my career where I was just collecting stuff for the sake of it, really, because it was valuable or because it was rare. And it was like a, you were know, sort of showing off, really. But I got rid of all of that stuff. And um, so I made a determined effort to, to try and learn this new format. 
and um, you know d discovering the potential of it. And um, I mean, I still don't really understand it, but um, you know, I've got a lot of. of I like. I, I love making music. For me, is you know, the the joy of making music is mostly in the process. It's it's not so much the record at the end or, or the other stuff that goes with it. The actual process of fiddling about with knobs and dials and sliders. <laughs> you know, I love that shit. <laughs> Um, th and the title of the album, what, what inspired that? Where did that come from? Well, it was actually, I, it was, it, I came up with the idea for, the, for a previous um, Erasure record, and Andy wasn't so keen, you know, fair enough. But obviously, you know, I, I, you, you probably know I'm a huge fan of Simon and Garfunkel, and one of the, f the, the, the first records that inspired me to make music and, and maybe make a living out of making music was listening to their music and of course the, you know the sounds of silence um i could play i mean i knew the, all the chords and everything you know i bought got the songbook and and i just thought that it was it, it, i i i i fi i think that the, the the title says it all really i mean it's uh, it's not yeah. a it's a great title for that record yes it's you know it's not a song based uh, album when did you, I mean, you said you started out by, you know, trying out a few experiments and practicing and learning. There must have come a po point where you thought, actually, this could be an album. No, no, never. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, I mean, when I sent you the stuff, Daniel got in touch, we were t talking um, or emailing, or, and he said, what am, I, what am I doing? And I said, I'm doing a few things, messing around. And he said, send me some stuff, you know, just out of curiosity. Hmm. And um, so I did. And then he got back in touch and said, you know, maybe, you know, we could release this as a record. But I was in total shock because it wasn't really what I intended. I mean, I, was, I, would, I would have happily just been carrying on making drones. But you sent it to me as an album, didn't you? Or did you? Or you just no, no I just sent it <laughs> what I thought were the best tracks. Okay. <laughs> this is how it works, you know, in the music business, right? <laughs> it's really formalised. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And um, there's an interesting, the, the, the song Blackleg, yeah. that used, as, for those who've heard the album or, or saw, the, saw the show last Friday, that has a sample in yes. it of, a, of an old traditional union song. Yeah. Um, who, how did you find that sample? Well, I, I, you know, I might have this wrong, but many, many years ago, I was working with um, Martin Ware from Heaven 17, um, and we were doing music for it for art installations, and he just happened to give me this tape of this this um, a cappella folk song, and said maybe you can make something of it. And I spent years trying to make it into a song, you know, trying to time it, trying to get the right pitch, turn it into a, a traditional song, but it just wasn't working. And then I did one of my drone tracks, and I just thought, I wonder if this is this is gonna. Maybe I can sit that on top. And I, I recorded it on top of the track that I had. And it was one of those really weird moments. I didn't have to tune it or time it. It just sat on this track, like magically and beautifully, and just, just worked. Just and, fitted, yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, and it's a very emotional song. It, you know, the lyrics are really hard hitting, and um, it just seemed to work with that track. And uh, I don't know if who was there uh, on Friday, but the visual for that was absolutely was stunning as well. And um, I'm quite interested actually about the visuals for the live show. Yeah. Because there's some absolutely brilliant, there was some, who was there on Friday? <laughs> Good, well done. Um, <laughs> the visuals were, were stunning. Uh, can you, do you want to talk a little bit about those and how, how, you, how they came together? Yeah, so I was talking to uh, Richard, the guy that runs the EIS, who you, you all know, Richard, right? <laughs> and I, I just mentioned, I said, it would, might be interesting to do some kind of event um, to kind of launch the record. And he was really, really enthusiastic about the idea. And, um, and then I thought, I don't want it to be a traditional concert. I don't want, mainly because I'm not that interesting. And, you know, there's no Andy Bell to... to you know, at the front. So, and I've always wanted to do something 
like a visual show. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, you know, the, I mean, it was done very early in the early days, like with, you know, obviously with the Human League and the the very first two albums, and many people after that. But I've always wanted to try and do something like that, so I started compiling these ideas for visuals. Some of them I commissioned. You know, I got some people, uh, found some people from all over the world actually that put together various visual ideas for some of the songs. A lot of the ideas I got from archival. Archive, archival, archival. Oh yeah, from the archives. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and edited those together. Um, uh, and then some ideas were a lot more graphic kind of ideas. But the idea always was that the show wouldn't be um, a band or a, 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 an act with visuals. It would be visuals with music. And we wanted it to be all-encompassing, which is why the screens were on the outside as well as being the main screen at the front. Yeah, it works super. Works really, really great. Really moving. Really incredibly well-chosen uh, images for the music. And it's really interesting because you know when you put a visual that has nothing to do with the track, suddenly the track becomes something completely different. So what? So it's a solo album. Um, what's what's going on with Erasure? So yeah, we're um, as I said earlier, we, we I've started doing some demos and putting some ideas together to play to Andy. He he hasn't actually heard any of those yet. Um, so we're hoping to start. Um, we'll get together because we we, we 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 never write remotely. It just doesn't work for us. <clears throat> we have to be in the same room at the same time and uh, to to make a complete song. It's just because it's just that. The, you know, our chemistry is very special and our relationship is very special. And um, uh, when we can go into a room with no ideas and come out with one good idea, it's like a magical thing. And I love that. You know, I still, I, I, it, it, I still get super excited when that happens. So, yes, yeah, so I've done a few, I've put a few ideas together. And um, hopefully uh, at the beginning of next year, we'll, we'll start actually formulating them into, into songs and then... Th that will be an album. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just so, yeah, Andy's also working on a solo album at the moment, so... Yes. Expect that at some point soon. Um, I mean, history-wise, uh, do you want to talk about the history a little bit? Absolutely, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, you know, we, we you know, talk about 1980. I'm not, you know, not going to go too oh. deep. When I saw, when we had that non-meeting at the Rough Trade Shop, and then I saw Depeche play, um, I saw Depeche play at the, uh, at the Bridge House in Canning Town supporting Fab Gadget. Um, oh, wow, that's a nice sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I just, I just, yeah, I just immediately wanted to work with them. Um, and I had a kind of awkward conversation there was kind of a backstage, um, small, a small room, really. It was a, a pub. It was a music pub, so they were, they were used to having bands there. There was a backstage. But I remember going backstage, and I didn't recognize them from that rough trade non-meeting, but they remembered me not being very friendly <laughs> <laughs> and were not, not well, that well pleased to see me. Oh no, they, no, that's not true because that we, you know, we knew, we always knew that <laughs> Beat Records was a cool label, yeah. and um, you know, and, and even the the privilege of being be, being able to play with Fad, yeah. with Fad Gadget was was incredible for us. Yeah. I mean, that was the music that we were listening to. It totally was, yeah. you know, this, you know, obviously the normal, the Silicon yeah. Teens, Fad Gadget, and you know, all of that stuff was being played at our parties in in Basildon. So, <laughs> yay, yay, Basildon. <laughs> But we, I think, the first thing that we did was with Steve-O, right? Well, well, we. Uh, that's a that's a that's a historically um, controversial. Um, th the way I remember it is yeah. this, <laughs> <laughs> and various other. But, so I came to see you play a second time there, and Steve-O was there, right? And um, Matt from the Ver was there. Mm. And I don't know if, I'm not sure if Mark Armand was there. From the, from, we were all kind of talking to each other. Nobody had released any records yet. But um, so it was a little kind of 
futurist. We didn't. I don't think you called yourselves new romantics. More like futurists in those days. It was we? more. Yeah, but it was more cooler to be a futurist. Yeah, yeah, it was cooler. Yeah. And Steve-O, very young at that time, he had a he had a uh, he was a DJ and had a chart called the Futurist Chart and everything. And he wanted to put he wanted to sign Depeche as well. I mean, we, I never actually signed Depeche, as some of you might know. We never did contracts in those days, but he wanted to work with Depeche. And I wanted to work with Depeche, and he was, he was, he's a, he's a character, he's a character still, he's very much a character. And then he's, he said, all right, well, I'll, I'll do soft sell then, and you can have Depeche, <laughs> my Depeche mode. So, <laughs> it was, that's just how it worked. And he said, but I want you to do, do a tr I want you to do, get them to do a track for my compilation, the Some Bizarre compilation, which is, which is a fantastic, I mean, an amazing document of the time, and a really great, really great record. So we did. We went into a studio called Stage One. That's Stage right, one. yeah. Stage yeah. One in the East End somewhere, and yeah. yeah, did photographic. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember when Steve, because we, we, could we the, myself and the band were talking about when I, whether we should, you know, uh, uh, be with Steve or yourself. Mm. And Steve said, "Well, you know, if you come with me, I'll get you a support slot with Ultravox." <laughs> and it was, and really, that really was a temptation, you know, at the time. Yeah. Well, and in the end, I think we did do a sort of a little mini tour. You definitely you supported Ultravox at the People's Palace. That's right, yeah. Which was Rusty Egan's, because like it, it was the whole. It was all part of the New Romantic Blitz Club thing. Yeah. And they did a concert, with, uh, which was kind of a more public. It was the first kind of big public out outing of all the those a lot of those bands, you know, and Ultravox headlined. And you were first on, I remember. <laughs> yeah. And I think you sat on a something to do with the stage then, and nearly collapsed on top of. Um, I think I don't remember that good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they had. I remember they had an endless sound check. <laughs> uh, you know, like headliner bands do. You know, and everybody else got about five minutes each. But yeah. And so anyway, so we did photographic. Yeah. Which, well, actually, I remember. Because I had the demos, or I had, a, had demos, or I had a live recording that I'd done on a cassette, I can't remember. And I couldn't decide at the time, it was all very rushed, and I couldn't decide which track we should do for the Some Bizarre album and which tracks we should do for the singles. I wanted to do a really great track for Some Bizarre, but I also didn't want to throw away a great track for the single. So, but there were so many amazing songs on there, so many amazing, you know, it was uh, so. Did we did we end we ended up doing photographic, which I think turned out great actually. Yeah, and that was the first time that we met the ARP twenty six. The ARP twenty six hundred, yeah. Yeah. So Daniel and we'd never used a sequencer before because we were always playing. We were playing live, and um, I mean, I I was I was blown away. I'm thinking, wow, you know, because we all played out of time, and suddenly there was this piece of equipment that put us in sync. Yeah. <laughs> it made us sound really good. <laughs> You sounded really good playing live as well, <laughs> I have to say. But uh, actually, funnily enough, sorry, I'm not, I don't want to get too nerdy here, but I, I think there's a, there's a video on YouTube, because I got like three or four people sent it to me the last couple of days, about the Depeche Mode speak and spell kick drum. Oh, my God, yeah. How to get a kick drum on a, using the ARP 2600, anyway. Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> look, I, I will get nerdy with that, right? Because we, we started recording the Depeche Mode album in um, Blackwing Studios, in South London, and you know, I mean, the ARP 2600 synthesizer is an amazing piece of equipment. But Daniel would spend freaking hours doing the kick drum, <laughs> and we're like, we're we're all sitting there like that, and it was just like, doo, doo, doo. and it just didn't seem to change. <laughs> like, hour on hour, we never really understood that. But you know, kick drum is important in electronic music. Well, I understand. <laughs> I I appreciate that now. Yes. <laughs> And there were no, there were no uh, 808s or 909s at the time. No, like we had a... Or lin drums. So we, you know, we just wanted to make a drum sound that was better. Yeah, we started off with a DR55. Do you remember those? Yeah, the Dr. Rhythm. Dr. Rhythm, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, and that was, a, you know, a, 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 it's just incredible going, looking back now, how fast things happened. You know, I think we started, we did the photographic at the end of 1980. Um, and all of a sudden, I think that's the track that people were, on that album people were really attracted to. Yeah. I remember John, Ple John Peel played it a couple of times, which 
at that point, in, uh, for a band like Depeche or any of the bands that we work with, to be on John Peel was like Big the, deal. the goal. That was the ultimate, you know, because he was he was the great inf influencer, really, of, mu of, of music at the time. Yeah. And um, then, the, you know, things just went really fast. They did, yeah. And then you decided to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. As one does. <laughs> As one does. Yeah. That's it. Well, that's the last question. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know if you want to expand on that. Or not, just really. Move, not really. We'll just, no, move. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just move on then. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and I remember when you came to play me uh, the demo of Only You. There we go. <laughs> I was in the, our office at that time. It was the first, our first office when we started working with Vince and the band. There was no office. Um, and I was in the office. I was, it was a weekend and I had a little synth set up. And uh, I was mucking about and Vince came in. So I got, I got, this, got this tune. This, this, you know, working with this girl, Alison. Which you said, can I play? I said, sure. Well, okay. The, this is the truth. <laughs> we, we, so Daniel's office was in Seymour Place? Correct. Yes, it was like a shop front, really. So he was in there messing about with his ARP 2600. No, and, System um, 100M. Ooh. Sorry. Just to, yeah. Already. But just to be, you know, Already electronically correct. <laughs> <laughs> and I played in the demo, and he just... <laughs> you know, he just doesn't seem to be particularly interested. And weirdly... Um, our publishers all marched in at the same time for because they were having a meeting with you or something. Yeah. And one was from Sweden, one was from Denmark, one from Norway, and the English guy. Rob and, Buckle. Uh, yeah, Rob Buckle. And they said, oh, well, they, we, re we really like this song. And they said, you know, maybe, Daniel, you, you should have a listen. So have a listen I, again. I mean, I, was, I guess I was just... I don't know why I, I just was. I think I was just surprised, really. I think that was it. I didn't really know what to think. It was very different of, from what Vince had done before. Obviously, it was Alison Moye singing, um, fantastic voice, an, an amazing song. I'm just trying to remember what, you know, what, what I, why I was a bit hesitant at the beginning. I can't really remember, but you know. But I did think at the time. I thought, well, okay, Daniel doesn't like it, so I'm just going to go back to doing what I did before, which was probably working in a yoghurt factory. And, I mean, which was fine. I mean, I didn't, you know, I wasn't expecting anything. You know, I mean, it was just, I did this demo, and yeah. it was, like, really rough. We did it on a four-track on a port studio. Alison sang it, and it was meant as a demo, really. Mm. And then, um, but then, the, the, when, as I say, when these guys came in, and they said, oh, maybe, Daniel, you know, you could <laughs> take, some, take, take, take some interest. <laughs> And yeah, that was the beginning of Only You. Yeah, and the beginning of Yazoo. Yeah. Or Yaz to our American friends. Um, which, again, became hugely successful really fast. I think, I mean, Only You was the first single, was it? Yeah. yeah, it was weird. It was one of those. It was back in the day when you, when you, could, you, could, you could chart at like number 60 in the charts and actually go up. And it went up and up and up and up everywhere. Yeah. When we were amazed. Well, everything in every you know, I, people ask me, but I'm always. I tell them that everything was amazing because it, you never you, you never expected anything. It was always like next week when Depeche Mode started playing live. It was like, wow, we've got a gig next week as well. And then yeah. like, and then we met Daniel, and, and Daniel's going to release a single. He goes, wow, <laughs> everything was like like that like that all the time. And then this only you single went up and up and up and up in the charts. And it was yeah. mind-blowing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing was, obviously everything was very different in those days. Um, but if you got in the top 75, Woolworths, remember Woolworths? They were the biggest record shop in the UK. I mean, obviously they're a big shop, but they, they, they were the biggest record sellers in, in the UK. And they would order... Um, Tens of thousands, if you just, even if you just got in the top 75. And so it just had to get over that little hump. And then if people bought it from Woolworths, then it would go up. And then you'd get top of the pops. Yeah. And then 
you know, it, it just it was a process. I remember even with New Life, we just kept, you know that started really low and this just crept up and up and up. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that's yeah. Only you, and then of course upstairs at Eric's. Well, you recorded with that uh, producer with Eric Radcliffe. Yes. Who Which ran Blackwing Studios, which, is, as you mentioned, was the studio we used all the time at that point. Yeah, that's where you recorded the Silicon Teen stuff, right? Some of it, yeah, yeah. And he was, he was, I was very, at the time before even I met these guys, I was very anti-recording studio because it was, to me, that was... They really? looked me like... <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, because it was very, it was too... Anything that had anything to do with the music business, I really hated because I wanted to have be independent of the music business and part of that was recording studios because my original originally I was just had a little four track at home and did stuff there but Blackwing was the first recording studio that I worked with and because I was just coming in with black boxes um, I spoke to Eric who Eric uh, he was a great musician he was a scientist as well he was actually at Imperial College with Queen Yes. And he nearly got into Queen, but he, uh, the only reason he didn't is because his backing vocals weren't good enough. <laughs> that's what that's what he said anyway. <laughs> yeah. But he was a sci- you know, we were try- we were kind of on the cutting edge. I mean, none of us knew what we were doing. That's the first thing, you know. I knew very slightly more than the band, but only very slightly. He was so we had a lot of technical things we needed to sort out, and he was so enthusiastic about. Yes. Sorting everything out, and making it work for us—it was great, a really great yes. experience, you know. Yeah, he was a, a, an amazing engineer. I mean, yeah. I was fortunate enough. We, he, he and I, kind of um, uh, built another studio, a second studio at Blackwing, and mm. uh, he, he was one of those guys because I was full of questions. I mean, what does that do? What does that do? Was it? And he never—he was always patient and kind to show me how these things worked mm. because he loved doing it himself, actually. Yeah. And I believe that he was the person that taught you how you can synchronise sequences and drum machines together exactly. on tape. Exactly. He was. We don't want to go too technical, but yeah, but that was that was a major breakthrough in production yeah. for our for our way of we worked um, to be able to do that. But yeah, and he produced both Yazoo albums, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. Um, I th- the second album was a bit fraught the making slightly <laughs> and then you left <laughs> yeah. and moving on yeah <laughs> and uh, and um, this is all a bit chronological but you know and then there was the assembly yeah and that was with eric actually yeah because he and i then we had a, a really good relationship mm. working relationship and um i was right i was messing about in the studio at that point you know really just mm. You I mean, how, I mean, how old were you when Yazoo finished? 23, 22, yeah, something, something like, like that? Because that, yeah. when we first met, you were 19, 18 or 19. Yes. Right? So you had an amazing amount of success. I mean, Yazoo was huge. We were very, very lucky. Very it lucky. Was a great record. They were a great record. But they, it was huge. You had a ton of a success at a very early age. Did you feel... How, uh, did that give, was that a pressure on you? Did, that, did you feel the pressure of... Producing and keeping going with that level of success, and was was that no, a no. To be honest, no. I mean, I was just enjoying it. I think I was enjoying being in the studio. Yeah, you know that was that was mm-hmm. enough. That was enough for me. And yeah. um, and, 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 it's, and Daniel never. There was never da- pressure from Daniel. Not that he told me. <laughs> um, you know, to to make a record or to mm-hmm. or, or or to you know to write a hit or anything like that. You know, I mean Mute, that wasn't what Mute was about anyway. So um, I just love being in the studio and experimenting. Uh, as I said earlier, I mean, the, you know, the whole, for me, the process is the most joyous part of, 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 make, of, of the music business for me. Yeah, you love the studio. Yeah. I know that, yeah. And you learn very fast as well, I have to say. Well, I, I noticed that when we started working together, you learned really, really fast. Yeah. I was interested. I mean, I was really cu- always curious about this stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Especially when you found out you found a machine that could actually play, that could actually play in time and better than you could actually play on the keyboards. <laughs> like revelation. <laughs> <laughs> and Fergal Sharkey, how was? I mean, Fergal is, you know, the, he currently this he's the he's the clean water activist, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Which is a, that know. was a weird one because what happened? I'd written this song and um, um, there was a rumor. In one of the pop, the, the, the 
sort of teenage pop magazines that I was working with Fergal Sharkey, which was not true at all. <laughs> and you you contacted me and said, that sounds like quite a good idea, actually. <laughs> so so uh, we got in touch with Fergal, and he flew over from Belfast. We were shit scared, because he was in a punk band, you know? And we were like nerdy, like electronic guys and everything. And he came over. He, I, I think he did three takes of that song. Yeah. Sang it, you know, it was absolutely perfect and brilliant. Mm. And um, yeah, that was that was that, that was, was an amazing time actually. Yeah. But the assembly was going to be what is now quite common, but then was a very innovative idea. The, I think the idea was to do like a collaborations album, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, we thought, well, it would be quite interesting to write a song and then to get various people to do vocals for different songs. But we tried it for a while and a few people came to the studio and it, it just didn't seem to happen. And then I started working at Trident Studios in, in Soho with Flood. And, um, the legendary producer. The legendary producer, yeah. And uh, he said, well, look, you know, you, you need to get someone permanent. So that's when we did the auditions, and he came to the auditions, and he sounded amazing, hence Erasure. <laughs> and the first album, Flood produced the first album, yep. with some great tracks on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it didn't connect with people at the time, and it's the first time that Vince, one of Vince's, because the Assembly record with Fergal was the top five hit as well. And it was the first, tr the first project that didn't quite take off at the beginning. No, but man, we had a such we had such fun recording it. <laughs> I mean, we you know we spent way too long doing it, spent way too much doing it. But we were really proud. We thought it was a good product and everything. And uh, but it wasn't happening. No one played it on the radio. Dollar did, Dollar did a cover of one of the songs. Did it quite <laughs> well. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that, mate. And uh, that's when we just Andy and I decided that okay. No one's going to hear our music via the radio. Let's let's start playing live, and then we really did play as m as many gigs as we possibly could. I remember, and um, you know, after all the success of of Depeche and Yaz, Yazoo, you basically did a back of the van. It was like a transit job, wasn't it? Yeah, back, back yeah, no, it was back to route, back to your roots. Yeah, yeah and it was yeah, and the th the th yeah the. And the, but also, I don't know if you remember Vince, but both, you know, both me and you, we were actually questioning if Newt was the right label, because we weren't making any connections. You know, you, you know, it was, it was kind of a weird time, really, because the, and it wasn't till, but yeah, but then you decided you did the jo you did the work, you went out and played, and then we released, sometimes, and I remember that you were on tour while that at the time that record was released. And you were playing to, I don't know, you played the marquee, I remember. Yes. Oh with God. Primal Scream. <laughs> yeah. And that kind of size venue. Um, and, then, and then sometimes got on the radio, just got on the radio <laughs> somehow. And during that tour, and I remember <coughs> the audiences grew and grew and grew. And I remember you, the last gig you were due to play was at the Mean Fiddler and in Harleston. And... It, there was queues around the block. It was amazing. There was no queues in the early gigs. It was just a few, a few fans, and it just grew very fast. And I remember those. We had to do a few mean fiddlers to to accommodate all of the people, and that turned out to be huge as well. Yeah, we were very lucky. Yeah, very lucky. Um, we could go on for hours. <laughs> maybe, <coughs> maybe for the next album, we can do part two of this. I just wanted to open it up a little bit to, to the audience to see if there are any questions. Um, oh, God, with hands going up. The, the young gentleman here in the front. Do you, sorry, just for those at the back, I don't know if you heard that. Just, I'll just repeat the question. Would you be interested in playing one of your albums back to back, you know, uh, live from beginning to end, yeah, kind of thing? Beginning to end, sorry, yeah, beginning to end, yeah. Yeah, I would actually, yeah. And the album would be chorus. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's um, 
I like that idea. I mean, I would, I, I would, I would see a band to, I, if Pink Floyd were going to play Dark Side of the Moon from back to back, then I would see it absolutely. <laughs> yeah, or Kraftwerk and um, Computer World back yeah. to back, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't hear what he said. Original gear. Original gear. <laughs> <laughs> The gentleman, yes. First of all, thank you for your music so far. Um, have you ever considered doing another Yazoo reconnected tour? No, I mean we did the, the reconnected tour and it was fun. It was nice to get to know Alison. So I didn't. We never really knew each other, to be honest. You know, in our, in our short time together, and that was great. But you know, we've moved, we've moved in in, in quite different directions. So I think it's. Um, I like, you know, I, I, it's always about the next thing. It's about looking forward. So, yes, young lady in the front here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel really honoured. I've been a massive fan of yours since I was 14, and I'm 51 now. Um, and unwittingly, you've had a sort of massive influence on our life. And I was wondering, sort of, what are the biggest influences, especially as you sort of change direction? I don't know. I'll, I mean, just, like, I'll just repeat the question for yeah, people no, in the yeah, back. Of course, yeah. um, the question was, what, inf what influenced your, all the different changes that you had during your career? Well, other, yeah, other music? Or? And the music now, sort of as it changes direction again. Yeah. So what, what are your biggest influences I, in that you know, sense? I mean, I, 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 I like all... I mean, I like... Uh, this is a bit of a cliche, but I like all kinds of music, apart from jazz. <laughs> um, so... And um, uh, uh, Reed and I, the guy that plays cello on the on the record, the current record, he and I have uh, had a radio show that we were doing in New, in uh, in New York, and so it was a two-hour show of electronic music. So we had to find two hours of music every two weeks, and that was a way of me actually finding new music. Now I hadn't been listening, to, I hadn't been looking for new music for years. I was sort of stuck on Gary Newman. <laughs> you know, for 20 years or something. But it was an opportunity, or it, it was a situation where I was actually forced to go into into discovering new stuff via Spotify. You know, whatever. But, um, so I'm, 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 I'm constantly influenced because I'm exposed to new music all of the time. Unfortunately, my son is um, a Swifty. <laughs> so... And I like Taylor Swift up to a point, you know. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I've discovered I, uh, during that period, I discovered a lot of interesting experimental ambient music, which I would never have dreamed of listening to like 20 years ago. But now I find it really interesting. I think also it's because I'm a bit older and I've got more patience to go for a track. I don't necessarily need a, like a great big chorus or, a, or an anthem or anything, you know. The emotions that you derive from listening to music like that are, are completely different. And in my case, I find it very, uh, very, 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 very therapeutic. Can I, I'll just repeat the question yes, of course, for those in. <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> just repeat it for the uh, audience yeah. at the back. How was it? How important was it to learn how to use the BBC? Uh, the UMI sequence on the BBC computer, wasn't it? The UMI, yeah. UMI, yeah. yeah. Was well, so originally what was, we we went from using the ARP twenty six, not the ARP twenty six, sorry, the ARP sixteen step sequencer. And then I bought a thing called an MC four, which is a four channel monophonic. Um, sequencer, which you could program, and then MIDI got invented, and the Yumi was one of the very first computer-based MIDI sequencers, and that had 16 tracks, so it enabled us to actually play, to trigger synthesizers live, in a in a live situation, and um, it didn't take me long to learn it. Really, I 
I think I'm quite fast at picking stuff well, like that I remember that how up. fast you... How, I mean, I could never figure out the MC4, and you got it in, like, an afternoon. Yeah. Well, the MC4s yeah. were all based on numbers, so it's all, it's, so it's all based on 12s. I used to dream and in, I used to sleep just thinking about multiples of 12. <laughs> but, um, yeah... Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was, the Yumi was an amazing piece of equipment, it's still, and still is, you know. But I, I got this this thing that I'm thinking, you know, man, it's just not the timing of it is not very, it's not, it's not as concise. I'm not a person to make music that you feel particularly. I want it to be exactly in time, and the, the Yumi didn't do that for me. So then I, what I would do, I would record the music, program the music with the Yumi sequencer, which was fairly easy to do, transfer it back into an analog sequencer, which was the MC4, and then record it from there. And then we would use the scope to make sure that everything was exactly in time. <laughs> Night right there. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more. Oh, God, I can't even see. Ooh, somebody here down the front? No, I would love to do. I mean, we had, Martin and I really enjoyed I think, well, I enjoyed it. I don't know if he enjoyed it. <laughs> he did, yeah, definitely. But, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And um, the best thing about it, actually, was I never knew Martin. I didn't know Martin. We had no relationship whatsoever. I mean, even when he was in, you know, when we were in the band together, he was Fletcher's friend. And um, we didn't, yeah, so we didn't have much in common. They went to the other school, yeah. right? <laughs> and... Um, so it was lovely to connect with him in that way. And I knew that he was interested in that kind of music. So I just emailed him out of the blue and I said, Mark, you know, Martin, do you fancy doing this kind of minimal electro type instrumental record? And he was totally up for it. And then we got to, we were basically exchanging files over the period of the recording process. Um, he would, you know, take out all my crappy ideas and. <laughs> replace them with better ones <laughs> and then we finally got to meet properly when we did some, we did some promotion in, in, in LA you didn't and meet at all during the making of the record right? no we didn't, no, yeah. no and, and it was really fortunate for me because he was re super busy I mean you know, they're always on tour or recording and stuff so we, I just happened to catch him at the right time when he was, had some downtime and um, it was just a lovely, lovely experience. Whether we do it again, it's not down to me. It's down to him. <laughs> Thank you. See, so I, I did a record um, t with uh, Phil Hartnell from Orbital. And um, that was one of those weird kind of... Th my keyboard tech knew him and... We happened to be in Brighton, where he lives, and we got together. And we just we were just exchanging ideas, really. Um, but he's also a super synthesizer geek, so immediately we, we connected, you know, and we did this 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 album. And hopefully, I mean, you know, maybe we'll release it as a proper vinyl or something at some point in the future. But at the moment, it's available. It's still available as a download. <laughs> Okay, I'm told we can have a one more question. One more. One more. I'm sure we did. <laughs> well, um, unfortunately, no. <laughs> Not at the moment, no. Oh, well, Vince, thank you very much. That was uh, amazing. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, th I think we uh, I think we learned a lot. We learned a lot from that. Thank you for being so open and uh, transparent. Thanks for coming along. <laughs> Apparently, I'm going to sign some stuff. Yes. So. Uh, <laughs>
So I don't know where that is over there somewhere, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, see you there in the queue. Bye-bye. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.